facility meeting for three items we need to take care of. So I'm going to call that special board meeting of the Anchorage Area School District Board of School Directors on Wednesday, June 6, 2018. It's now called to order. Please rise for the quiet statement. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Public videotaping. The purpose of videotaping a meeting is for public information. The opinions expressed by any member of the public do not necessarily reflect the view or opinion of the Ambridge Area School District Board of School Directors and are solely that of the speaker. The Ambridge Area School District Board of School Directors hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any false, defamatory, or slanderous statements expressed by the speaker. Any unauthorized rebroadcasting of any video, audio, or still image of the video recording of this meeting is strictly forbidden without the written permission of the Ambridge Area School District Board of School Directors. May I have a roll call, please? Mrs. Fisher. Mrs. Kehoe. Here. Mr. Kowal. Here. Mrs. Locker. Here. Mrs. Milan. Here. Mrs. Pedigo. Here. Mr. Sass. Here. Mr. Weir. Here. Mr. Angus. Here. Eight members present. Thank you. The Sunshine Law, please. Section 708 of the Sunshine Law permits agencies to hold executive sessions to discuss employment and personnel matters, labor relations and arbitration matters, purchase or lease of real estate up to the time an option or agreement is obtained, litigation or potential litigation, and other agency business which, if discussed in public, would violate, violate lawful privilege or would violate confidentiality laws. The Board of School Directors held an executive session Wednesday, June 6, 2018 to discuss employment and personnel matters, salary schedule and labor relations, and litigation or potential litigation. Thank you. Uh, public comment right now is regarding agenda items only. At this time, district residents may come forward to comment on agenda items only. Each person must state their first and last name and address prior to speaking. Each resident will be allowed three minutes and can speak only once. This period for public comment prior to the standing committee reports will be limited to one half hour. <coughs> Although not required, board members desiring to address questions or concerns may do so after the resident's comment or question or at the conclusion of the committee reports. There will still be an opportunity for residents to comment on any business relevant to the Ambridge Area School District under old and new business at the end of the meeting. So the floor is now open for any comments on the three items that are up for vote this evening. Okay. Seeing no one, we'll proceed with the committee reports, finance, and budget. Mr. Sass, please. Thank you. One item related to the lease proposal to amend the existing master lease associated with technology equipment under a three-year basis, the total cost is $498,000, approximately payable over three years. I make a motion to accept uh, item number one. I have a motion to accept item number one. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mrs. Pio. Yes. Mr. Cole. Yes. Mrs. Locker. Yes. Mrs. Milan. Yes. Mrs. Pedigo. Yes. Mr. Sass. Yes. Mr. Weir. Yes. Mr. Angus. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, building and grounds. Mr. Cobalt, please. Uh, under item number one is recommended to approve the resolution to accept bid tabulation from HHSDR consisting of all construction bids received by the district on May 30, 31st, 2018 for the middle school phase, two restroom improvements and miscellaneous gymnasium repair project at proposed cost of $296,000 as presented. I make a motion to accept item number one. Thank you. I have a motion for item one under building and grounds. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Milan. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mr. Kowal. Yes. Mrs. Locker. Yes. Mrs. Milan. Yes. Mrs. Pedigo. Yes. Mr. Sass. Yes. Mr. Weir. Yes. Mrs. Kehoe. Yes. Mr. Angus. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Under uh, personnel, Mrs. Walker. I have one item. Um, it's the approval of settlement of civil action with employee number 2319. So I make a motion to accept this item. I have a motion to accept item one under personnel. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Cobalt. Is there any discussion regarding item number one? Hearing none, then roll call, please. Mrs. Locker. I abstain. Mrs. Milan. Yes. Mrs. 
Pettigo. Yes. Mr. Sass. Yes. Mr. Weir. Yes. Mrs. Kehoe. Yes. Mr. Kowal. Abstain. Mr. Angus. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Is there anything from the solicitor side this evening, Mr. Weiss? Not even this evening. Thank you. All right. Any from the superintendent side? Nothing this evening. Okay. Order new business. It is now time for order new business. Anyone from the public who desires to comment on any business relevant to the Amber Area School District should now come forward, state your name and where you live. <coughs> Each person will be allowed three minutes and can speak only once. Is there anyone who has any business they'd like to address other than the budget workshop which we'll take care of after this? Hearing none, may I have a motion to adjourn the voting portion of the meeting? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Bobby. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, we'll adjourn the uh, voting portion and I'll turn the floor over to Mr. McFarland for the budget workshop. <coughs> I'm going to try to keep this somewhat informal tonight, so if you have questions as we go through this, um, just stop me and ask. If you have comments you want to make, please feel free. Um, you have three items in front of you um, tonight. You have the revision uh, budget document. Um, I'll put all of these up on the website tomorrow so the public can see them if they want to look at them. Um, so they'll be available for the public as well. You also have the food service budget um, for next year as well in front of you. And then you have the slide presentation that I'm going to go through here uh, this evening. Right now, as the budget stands, the budget is up. For the last time we met, it is now at $49,483,000 in expenditures, um, while the revenues are at $49,188,000. Um, that now means that your budget, which was balanced in May, is now out of balance by $295,000, which would be required to come from your fund balance to balance the budget. Um, this represents 3.9% in increased uh, spending, or about $1.8 here are the changes that have happened since the last presentation of the budget in May. Um, we have adjusted the technology purchases. They represent the lease agreement that you approved tonight. Um, they were decreased by $112,000, uh, mainly because not that we cut equipment, but we just rearranged and we, we were able to secure some additional discounts on equipment. Um, we're actually buying more projectors than we originally thought, but we were able to adjust many of the items that were in there as we got the actual quotes from the, from the companies. Um, so we were able to adjust that, that number down. Um, we did cut um, an administrator's wages and benefits due to a resignation. Um, so down one administrator. Um, reducing, uh, we reduced the paving scope and economy to more patching. So we were able to cut $113,000 for the budget there. Um, we had to add a new truck. We originally had thought we were going to convert a current truck to a flatbed truck, but when we took it to get inspected, we realized basically that it was going to cost way too much money to repair the truck than it was worth to get it to pass inspection. So we have been slowly replacing one truck at a time. This should be the last truck in the fleet that needs replaced for a little time, a little while, but at this point, the net effect of that in the budget was $30,000. Yes, Mr. And how did you go about purchasing this truck? We haven't purchased it yet. It's in the budget to be purchased. We typically purchase them through a cooperative purchasing agreement to the state contracts, co-stars, or one of the other ones. So we'll go out there and look for them that way. Um, Pre-K, we added a pre-K classroom to State Street when we submitted the grant this year. Um, we submitted for an additional pre-K classroom. Uh, basically, that has a net effect of zero in your budget because we increased the revenue side by the same amount as we increased the expenditure side. So in the end, while your expenditures went up, so did your revenue, so the net effect was nothing. Was well, um, that uh, two pre-K classes or three? That is, I believe, two at Highlands, one at Economy, and this will be one at State Street then for next year. If, if we get the grant. If we don't get the grant, obviously the money won't get spent. The pre-K counts grant? Pre-K counts for you, correct. Um, we added the cost of repair for the gymnasium that he approved tonight. Uh, we were going we're to be using exhausting the remaining funds in the construction fund to do the restrooms and a portion of the gymnasium repairs. 
Uh, however, we needed some additional money, so we were rearranged in the general fund um, to include the additional cost, the overage basically amount in the general fund to do that project. Um, there weren't any questions about that gymnasium tonight as you approved it, but it's basically uh, repainting of the gymnasium walls and ceiling that is badly flaking, uh, replacing the backboards in the gymnasium, and doing um, lighting improvements for the gymnasium as well. Is this the outside gymnasium? Right? This is the middle school, the junior high. Junior. Um, we had to increase our fuel costs for our buses and vehicles um, due to the increased rates or in increased fuel costs that we're all seeing on the pumps right now. Um, and then we had to add costs for settlements. And then finally, we had to add um, some additional adjustments for joint purchasing, some of the supplemental uh, wage MOUs that you recently approved, and some other minor wage adjustments, but they all added up. So um, I think we have the staffing pretty much locked in place now. So can you back to the first slide? Does that uh, 49 million 188, does that include the prior 2.14 million increase? It does. It includes the tax. <coughs> so the fund balance utilization would be over and above. That is correct. Okay. And then on the second uh, on the second slide, uh, can you at least tell us the added cost of settlement? How many settlements that included? That is one settlement. That is one. So that is a that is cost of settlement. Settlement. I guess that would have been a more appropriate verbiage. <laughs> are, are these all the that is the major changes. Okay. There are so a few like others. A bit. Yeah. There are some other minor changes. I can give you the complete list. In fact, I think you have the complete yeah, list in your packet. I think this is the major one. I changed a number on it today. You did change a number it's on just it today. Um, okay, here with a little more detail on the revenues by source. Um, there's really no surprises here. It's the same every year. It doesn't change that significantly. but. Obviously, the majority of your revenue comes from local sources. That's why the taxpayer is burdened so much. And real estate makes up the bulk of that revenue source. It's a little over $20.7 million. Um, the other local revenues are your, your personal income tax, your earned income tax, your working down taxes, your capital taxes, all the other taxes that we assess. Um, Basic ed funding makes up about like $10.9 million. We're only seeing about a 0.7% increase from the state in funding for next year. Um, so um, in my opinion, a $72,000 increase is really not significant for the district. We'll take it, but again, really not making major strides to, um, to keep pace with what, what the costs for education are and all the mandates that we're, we see from down the road. Special ed subsidy as well. Uh, only increasing about 1.8 percent. Federal income is actually declining. We haven't got the final Title I allocations for next year yet. Those aren't coming out until the end of the month, so we might see still an adjustment in the budget once I get those numbers before the final adoption. Um, the other sources for funding are basically your lease agreement that you approved tonight. This is the tax assessment information. Nothing has changed here since last time. Uh, we're still recommending a 2.14 mil increase or a 2.7% increase to the, to the index. Um, that would make your new millage rate 81.435 mils. Um, we did see a tax assessment increase from the prior year of $741,000. That increase generates about 58, a little over $58,000 for the district. So it's not a huge increase, but it's some increase. Um, we are getting a tax reduction allocation, which is tied to the Homestead Farmstead uh, approved properties. Uh, right now, it looks like the calculation will net uh, a reduction in tax liability for every approved homestead or farmstead of about $164 in your tax bill. And just for informational purposes, one mill generates about $267,000. This is a little bit on the millage rate history. Uh, last year we were able to avoid a tax increase. Uh, this year we're looking at 2.7, but I just thought I'd give you that as information so you have a little background on where the millage is, um, where it has gone over the years. This is the impact. Medium home, median homestead value in the district is $23,450. At the new tax rate, that would be an increased tax liability of $50 for about $4.18 a month. 
again, your homestead exclusion, every ta every approved homestead farmstead will get a reduction of $164. Okay. <coughs> area expenditures, expenditures by operational area. The only really thing I'm trying to demonstrate here is to show you that uh, about 80% of your budget goes to directly into instructional programs or support services that directly support instructional programs. So the bulk of your money does go into educational programs. You do have a high debt service level at about 11%, between 11 and 12%. Um, and then non-instructional are things like your academics and your extracurricular activities. This budget for the first time does include, include capital improvements, which makes up 1% of that budget. But the professional services and other types of services go into the bulk of the 80%? Um, probably more in the, yeah, the bulk of the 80% it usually falls under the support services category. Okay, so what happens in the 17-18 budget, you overspent in those two categories $944,000 last year. So how does that impact 1819 when you were almost a million dollars over in your budget last year. I would have to look and see specifically where that was. I mean, you know, you have to wherever it was for two line items, 300 to 500, a million dollars, I would think someone would have an explanation. Well, I can tell that the 500 is probably tuition to other, other charter schools or um, cyber charter schools. Contract so, settlement? Could have been some other contract settlements. Yeah. The teacher contract. Could have been, yeah. So we spent an extra in the 500 category, $605,000. Well, you, at one point you, you had reserved, you had budgeted for additional money to be paid out for teacher contracts, but we didn't raise the millage based on that because we knew we had that held in reserve. So we had anticipated uh, probably pulling some of that money you know, from money that was budgeted in prior years. So. So you had a reserve of 750,000. There was a significant. I mean, there were two years you went by without teacher increases mm -hmm. that were planned for. So you budgeted nothing in 17, 18 to cover that. We budgeted for some increase, but there was obviously going to be some retroactivity that occurred. Okay. So um, retroactivity that we had to that we had to cover. Okay. Now I think the I'm board sure. minimized that retroactivity with the final settlement, but mm -hmm. there was still some law. Which in, included health benefits going up dramatically as well with negotiations. Um, health benefits didn't really go up dramatically um, because we switched to EPO plan from the PPO plan, so the rates actually went down for the district from from a health care standpoint. Um, well, Peasers, yeah, Peasers is always the big player in that. I mean, when you when you pay for your retirement contributions, that rate continues to go up. It's so about 33% right now. So if you have individual categories, for example, medical insurance, dental insurance, mm -hmm. vision insurance, that has nothing to do with PISA? No. Okay. No. So you had 74,000 in medical, 52,000 in, in dental, uh, vision was 23,000. So you increase those three categories, $150,000. Through for the, the next coming year? Sweet. Yeah. For the next budget year. For 1890. Yeah. Over, over 1780. Yeah. Part of part of that increase is that the district, by moving to ASIC, has an obligation to pay in a portion of the fund balance to get membership in that organization. So what you're seeing there, that largest that, that amount is largely the buy-in for that contribution. Mm -hmm. to do we get decreased rates going forward because you bought into this new plan? The idea with the new organization is that with ASIC you have, um, instead of the district standing alone with risk exposure, you have now membership of over 48,000 people. So the risk is spread evenly among all the districts and organizations that are a member of the healthcare organization. They've been able to stabilize rates over time. So the long-term vision is that your rate increases are not going to be as um, unstable and erratic as they have been in the past. They're going to, the history of ASIC is that most of the time we don't see increases above 5% and there haven't been there for over 10 or 12 years, 15 years. So we're anticipating having much more stable rates over time. 
and then you spent three hundred sixty thousand dollars less than what you budgeted for supplies and books. Right? So you didn't invest in the educational process. You withheld three hundred sixty thousand dollars. Well, I didn't withhold it. If they didn't order the items, then mm -hmm. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's surprising when you hear teachers complaining they don't have supplies and books. And this. I think we're working on that culture, and I think they're they're understanding that there is resources available for them to get what they need, and I think we, we're making that effort in this budget as well. So, But I'm also not going to tell people to buy things that they don't need. So if they, if they originally planned for it and then changed their focus and don't need to buy certain things, we have a lot of, well, we fix things as we see them, but I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing process, but there's certainly I believe a lot of supplies that are sitting around that you know we really need to revamp our bidding process and how we order things and how we maintain inventories. But you know we put it on the list. We I mean, we're working at getting to those things. So you know I came in and I work on the big items and we start to work on the other things as we as we get more resources and time to do that. I was only basing my comments on what I heard from uh, parents that came into meetings and made comments. By not having supplies and they have to pay for things and, mm -hmm. and they have to give to the teachers from the parents. That's the only reason I'm basing because I don't know what you spend on and what you save it for. But $360,000 less than what you budget, it seemed like an awful lot to me from an educational standpoint. I'd like to have seen you buy some books if you're selling for $360,000. That's all. All right, so looking at the expenditures from a different standpoint, I break this down by the type of expenditure that it is, and obviously personnel, no surprise, makes up 56% of your budget. That includes your wages and benefits for all staff. Um, I put some numbers in there about what the teacher, the wages, wages overall are up a little under 3%. Teachers' wages are up about 1.5%. Um, medical insurance is 2.4% um, increase anticipated, and the pieces rate is going up from the 32.57 currently this year to a little over 30, just under 33 and a half percent next year, which represents 3.75 percent increase in spending. Um, debt, as I said, is a little over 11 percent, or about 5.6 million dollars. Tuition is the same thing, ironically. Um, transportation makes up about 6.7 percent of your budget. Utilities, 2.2 percent, and then other contracted services. Uh, are 4.3 percent of your budget. Um, these may be services that we have we're obligated to provide through special ed, counseling, those types of things. Um, legal services, those types of things that we have to have. Um, when you add that all up, you're looking at a little over 91 percent of your budget that's already committed before we even start to talk about cutting things. What's the idea of what um, other schools use as far as Oh, our tuition portion is probably higher. I don't know what we would be in comparison to other Beaver County schools, but certainly from my prior school yeah. district, it's, it's much higher. Yeah. Yeah. Part of our goal with, I think, the middle school, Dr. Waller, you might be able to speak to it better than me, but is to try to attract some more people back from uh, places like Baden Academy, charter, cyber charter schools, and that, and so on with the new format. So uh, I think if we start to make strides with academic achievement, improvement, We'll start to see those trends change. I think people will come back to the district. But it's going to take time. Questions about that? Well, I, I was wondering if the last meeting we came to, we saw 14 people retire. So I'm just wondering, did that leave some holes in the teaching staff that need to be filled? or? Not, I mean, you can speak to staffing better than I can, but no. I, I they believe. weren't all teachers, so you don't save as much on support staff yeah. as you do teachers. I think we had six teacher retirements and we we were able through a major staffing process um, and attrition of those teachers, I think we have six that won't be replaced. We have to replace a nurse. Um, well, was but are all the classes, all the, the grades covered? Oh, absolutely. Right. Are you maintaining um, class size? Mm -hmm. uh, Small yes. class size rather than large class. I've never seen smaller class sizes than I have seen here. Okay. So what what do you project the average class size to be? Well, it's hard to say because it's different. 
If you only have two classrooms in a school building, two second grade classrooms, you might have 22 in those classes. And if you have three sections in another building, you might have 24 or 16. So there's not a consistent class size because there are so few sections in each of the three elementaries. Um, at, the, at the middle school, we're looking at 22 to 24 in most of the academic classrooms. Um, maybe a slightly higher in eighth grade. Uh, but we're trying to run that number at 22, 24. Um, there certainly will be some exceptions, but in things like science labs, we try to do <coughs> 24. And of course, in the primary levels, we like to keep it down a little bit lower, 22, 23. That's about the tops for those primary classrooms. And that's what you see for all three schools? Well, um, economy class sizes are higher, and um, we actually looked at, at, we have to wait until further on in the summer because people don't register sometimes until August, um, but economy was running some 26s. And, and I said to Ms. Galitzis a couple weeks ago, we really need to add a section in one of those grades, and she said that if some of those kids are leaving for whatever reason, and, and we won't add until August sometime if we need to. The hope so, is that we won't have to. And so then what's your prediction for State Street and economy? I mean, uh, Highland. Same thing at the primary level, 22, 24? It varies from grade level to grade level. We have two rounds in some grade levels, three rounds in others, and if you create that third round, sometimes those class sizes are smaller. It, uh, Highland <coughs> historically has had smaller class sizes, um, and that's because of the Title I funding that we have there. Okay. Things that are included in this budget include the staffing <coughs> changes that we were just talking about. There is a new textbook series adoption for math and science, or math and social studies. Um, there's also replacement of science textbooks at the secondary level. Um, we have talked about the NIMSI uh, staff development program that the district has uh, taken on for next year. Um, we have several technology and security purchases in this budget. Um, we have a reduced transfer, but still a transfer to the capital projects uh, fund so that we can continue to build that uh, for future needs. Uh, we have some capital purchases and maintenance projects and some other equipment purchases that I'm going to kind of go through that list. Uh, here are the staffing changes. Um, not much new here other than the, uh, uh, the reduction of the administration position, uh, saving the district $135,928. Um, you see that we have four positions that were eliminated due to attrition or retirement. Um, we have some other, two additional teacher retirements that netted some savings but are being replaced. Um, we have um, the hiring of a new middle school principal <coughs> in the budget. And then we have two support personnel retirements currently. We may end up with another one. Textbooks. Uh, the new math series for grades 6 through 8 is replacing a 2004 uh, copyright, uh, about $96,000 for that purchase. The social studies for grades 3 through 12 is a two-year purchase of $61,000 for each of the two years, replacing 1990 uh, series. Um, the science textbooks, $116,000, and you can see the different courses and the years dating back to 1997, 1999, 2004, 2006. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but um, the, door, the district did receive a grant. Uh, it includes about $750,000, I believe, over three years for different in-service and curriculum trainings for our staff. It does require the district to contribute uh, $25,000 annually for the staff development programs. And then there's some additional training costs for staff that we're estimating to be $13,500. Doug, is that one thirteen thousand per staff? Or the That's the total cost. Here are the technology and security purchases. There's really nothing new from the last time you saw this in May. They're just adjusted numbers. Um, it is, these are all part of the three-year lease that was approved tonight. And I thank you for approving that advance because that allows us to get things ordered so that we can have them here in time for the tech team to get them set up at the start of the new school year. So it does proceed the approval, the final approval of the budget, but timing is such that we really need to get that process moving. <coughs> 
Um, as far as security, we are buying some district radios so that the district will have radio communication not only within the district but tie into the local authorities as well. Um, there is a lot of new camera equipment going in. Uh, we did do, we revised our security operating system upgrade. We were able to do that a little more cost effectively, so that's a reduction from the last time you saw these numbers. Uh, but we were able to take our current system and kind of give it a newer version and not have to replace the whole thing. Um, and then we're going to put security card access on the elevators here in the high school so that uh, a card is required to operate the elevator that allows us to secure them during the evening events so people can't get up and down our buildings everywhere in the building for an evening event if they don't have a card. Will you be able to have those installed prior to beginning class? The plan is to have everything installed over the summer and be ready for the start of this school year. <coughs> A little bit on the capital reserve funding, um, about $5.3 million in there. Um, that money has really been set aside to pay off um, the debt that was issued in 2016 to do the renovations at the junior high. Uh, right now we have that um, for the most part covered. Um, there's some additional funding in there now because we don't currently owe the full point five point five. We've been making payments on it from this fund for a while. Uh, so we, we were able to pay off the 2016 debt that was issued without going for a tax increase to the public. Um, that was the strategy that was employed prior to my coming. We've continued that strategy. Uh, at this point, everything we add is really for future capital projects that we have uh, pending in the district. So we want to continue to try to keep that trend going as much as possible so that we can get caught up in a lot of the things that are I guess in disrepair or haven't been tended to over the years. Um, right now, I already know that we have <coughs> four, we have a little over four million dollars worth of paving and sidewalk repairs that need to be done that have been neglected. And obviously, we're not going to do that all overnight, but we've got to come up with a strategy on how we're going to start to attack that and start whittling down those improvements. Uh, we also are aware that we have bleachers in the field house that aren't being used, and the cost to replace those is about four hundred thousand dollars. I'll talk a little more about some other things. I have a question. Yeah. Go back a slide. Sure. The total debt service. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Total debt service of 5.5. Did we borrow money for the junior high 4.2 million? There was a $5 million bond issue that was done in 2016. I believe in August prior to my arrival that you used to do the HVAC improvements at the junior high. SAS might be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's what I, I thought. Mm -hmm. I thought there was, we did something to not to use the bond fund balance to do the junior high. It's basically it what we did. Yeah. We, 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 what we did is we chose to borrow money of about $5 million when the state had stopped sending reimbursements because of their budget impasse. Mm -hmm. And we feared that there would be a liquidity issue associated with the school district. So what we did was um, we borrowed $5 million in the left hand, but we transferred through this strategy over a number of years sufficient monies to basically, in technical terms, you would defease it. Um, so we, we transferred an equal amount of money into the capital projects, which was earmarked to pay this $5 million. And what that created was a 10 year liquidity window um, because the debt, so we, we did it. At, the five billion at a very short um, repayment schedule of about, uh, I think it's 10 years, so you pay about $600,000 a year. It's a very high annual debt service. But basically, we created liquidity by putting $5 million in the cash in the left hand and owing $5 million in the right hand. That debt service associated with that $5 million does not come from the general fund. It's not within all these budgets. It comes from capital projects as a transfer. So at the end of 10 years, you will have uh, zero debt, but you also have, will have zero money in your capital projects fund. Um, and all that money that, that was transferred it. over was basically from savings that you incurred from refunding a number of bond issues that right. you, had, you had on the books already. <coughs> My other question is the bleacher repairs are 400000 mm -hmm. That's a replacement. Replacement. Um, what, that field house, what is it used for? I mean, I know basketball is playing here, but you have a gym in the high school that you can use because I know 6A schools that have 
gyms just like we have and able to use one gym for all their facility for their people and players and sports and volleyball and everything else but yet we have two and we're going to put another four hundred thousand dollars to play some basketball well, i don't know that we're going to do that i just listed <laughs> out there as something that's out there on a list i don't know i believe that the administration agrees with your thought on the fact that we have a perfectly good facility here in the high school because i know that's why we moved them there this season yeah, the comments in the past have always been, well, we can get playoffs into the new gym. Well, if you're going to put four hundred thousand dollars in there in hopes to get some play, playoff games in there, you can't you're about ten, fifteen years before you recoup your keep if even then. Right. I think that's I, if you haven't approved it, I would that has not been suggest you don't approve four hundred thousand, especially with the budget that you're looking at right now. Right. And it's called the Wright Automotive Group Fieldhouse. They have naming rights. Does anybody on the board remember how much the naming rights went for the Wright Automotive Group? I have a contract in my office, and I can't remember what it is on the top of my Was it a one-time fee that no, was good in over perpetuity? Years. You and I talked about this, because yeah. I asked you about yeah. that. And I, I think it was through 2021, and I believe it was... I have to look. I can pull that out, though. But then I can remember. Somebody might want to call Ken Wright, who's a president, and say, Kenny, <laughs> hey, we need another four grand if you want to keep your name on the building. Yes, I hear you. Four hundred. Yeah. Four grand. <laughs> yeah. Four grand. Sorry, not four grand. Four hundred. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, capital projects and maintenance projects that are in this budget. Again, there's patching at the element, economy elementary for the circle at $150,000. Um, we're replacing the lockers at the middle school for a little under ninety thousand. Um, flooring and window covering changes at the middle school for fifty-six thousand. Um, stage lighting in very bad disrepair. It's dangerously at the school, dark. Almost middle. dangerously dark. Uh, Forty thousand dollars for that. Um, bridge repairs at the high school when the bridge at the entrance area of the high school was built, it did not have proper drainage, and we have a lot of rusting and erosion on that bridge. Uh, the lighting is also in disrepair because of the poor drainage. So uh, to do those significant repairs to the bridge is estimated at $75,000. Um, the bathroom sink sensors in the high school, if you've ever tried to use them, do not function very well. They, <coughs> they need replaced. Uh, and there's a mixing valve uh, that needs to be replaced at the high school as well for the water. Uh, that's 11500 uh, we're recommending that we put a pole building at the high school stadium for storage of equipment that is now being stored underneath bleachers that uh, is not being protected from the weather. We put a lot of money into buying equipment. We need to keep it protected from the weather. There's um, no, no, go ahead. There's no alternative place Not in the buildings. I mean, it's unless we want to haul it to one of us. We're trying to empty out our vacant buildings. I mean, I guess we could, I mean, we can cut that. It's not a big deal, but um, yeah, I just think it's going to be better functionally to, to start thinking about that. Right now you rent a, um, basically a storage cart at the middle school that you put things in that you're paying rental on every year. Um, you know, it might even make more sense to build it at the middle school for the track equipment and softball equipment rather than build at the high school start there and build one there um, so you don't have to pay that rental anymore but um, our suggestion is long term that if you're going to buy thousands and thousands of dollars worth of sporting equipment you need to protect it and not have it you end up replacing it before you need to replace it because you don't protect it properly. Did anybody look okay. into buying a pod type of situation? I don't know what term you want to use, but it's just a metal facility with a garage door, and you put it all in there, and it's yours, and you own it, and you don't have to build it. I think it would be a little more cost effective than building something and then having to maintain that building. It's certainly an option. It's, it's something to look at. Sure. Any other questions? I mean, that's certainly something we can I mean, it is $10,000 for the car car It doesn't make a difference. I mean, it. It's not going to balance the budget for us, $10,000. Put $10,000 times 10 things. Right. 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 So, yeah. So the decision of the Yeah. 
Um, gymnasium painting, <coughs> of course, those, those were approved tonight. And again, I mentioned they have to throw $120,000 from the general fund to pay for those. And the bathroom construction that we talked about that was approved tonight, that is all coming from the construction <coughs> fund. So that's not part of the general fund budget. Here are some other equipment purchases. The middle school, we're replacing uh, a lot of the furniture up there, a lot of the tables that were very uh, outdated, about $75,000 in uh, the cost for that. <coughs> and the operations and maintenance budget, there's the new truck that I talked about. Um, there are four riding floor cleaners, there's some leaf blowers, um, and there's some wax applicators. The cost for that is about $90,000. So Doug, we need four riding floor cleaners? Um, it would be our recommendation to do that just because you don't really have adequate staff to maintain your buildings. It's been cut over time. Uh, we're trying to get them equipment to keep them efficient and keep them moving and more effective and keep our buildings shining. Um, by getting the riding mowers, they can cover a lot of area much quicker and keep your buildings much cleaner looking. Throughout. So if you had one, you did the second floor of the high school, then the whole board could see what it looks like. Could we have some the high school. Yeah, one. Yeah, they, they're working on the uh, Again, you're you not going to get an argument from me over I understand. riding cleaner. If you want to cut them, that's certainly your priority to do. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say cut them, them but we'll they could perhaps be <coughs> in a subsequent budget. Sure. I mean, we could buy two and buy two next year. That's not a problem. We could buy one. Whatever you want. Doug, mm -hmm. uh, back on the other page where you have the patching of the economy parking lot, I guess, 150. It's the circle around the front of the building. The circle. Mm -hmm. Is that, um, you offer bid on that? or We will have to go out to bid. Sure. So that's just a number. Four. Yeah, unless we can find a cooperative purchase agreement for those types of services, it will have to be bid. So that number based on? That's based on our architect giving us an estimate. Um, athletics, um, there are a number of different items that are listed there, about $44,000 worth of athletic equipment. And then academics, there's different art displays, there's steel drums and marching drums in there, uh, a lot of different musical instruments, some microscopes, uh, science labware, um, some special and sensory equipment, um, and um, some nursing equipment, and there's some tech ed equipment with Lego kits and STEM Lego kits and so on. So that added under, up to about 50 Under seasons. athletics? Yeah. Why do we only say boys basketball, boys volleyball? Don't girls need uniforms? Or do we not have either I'm team? Sure the I uniforms are on a the uniforms are on a rotation schedule that Mr. Miller uses, so it just happens to be that it's the boys' years. I believe we've got girls' uniforms this far here. So it just it's a rotation schedule that's been developed. And, and, and so Mr. Miller's looking at these uniforms, they need to be replaced this year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then the, well, the varsity we're football wins yeah. tend to go down. So well, I'm not worried about Title IX. I'm right. just worried about it. it. Seems like all we see is all of a sudden it's football, basketball, and volleyball. That's what we do. And <laughs> all right, those two. I don't know. I, I'm just concerned that are we buying? Are we spending our money on <coughs> uniforms rather than academics? Uh, again, that the the academic budget makes up. One percent of your total budget, or two percent the next year. Well, I, so I guess my concern. I, I understand what you have said, and what the superintendent has said. But my complaint on this situation is: Do we have to spend all this money this year? Do we have to buy four floor cleaners this year? Uh, my response to that would be that you haven't done it for years. That's why it's coming to you. Well, um, you have okay. let things fall into disrepair. And Mr. Massey is giving us his best recommendation on how you're going to get out of that hole. So we're putting strategies in place to try to dig us out of things that have been neglected for years. And if we don't start it someday, you're never going to get there. And I so would, would agree with you response. starting somewhere, but I don't think we have to start a big somewhere this year that can't be parsed out and spread out a little bit. I mean, I understand we haven't been, and we need to start doing that. I agree with you. But I would like to try to make sure that what we do spend our money on 
you know, I mean, I brought the rest of us all have to live in our own budget. Um, you know, we don't have the liberty of going back to taxpayers for more money. I every, well, not every year because we didn't do it last year. I try not to. Well, I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just concerned that it seems like all of a sudden, not last year, but oh boy, now we got to do it this year. <coughs> and I understand what you're saying about the need to uh, start looking at some of these things. I agree with that. My complaint, though, is when we start looking at it, let's look at it on a, you know, today in a future budget. I don't want to spend everything this year. What are we going to look at? I mean, I think if these things, we don't buy four, we buy one. So we have the next year's budget and see what kind of money we have. I don't think this is, I mean, we are already the highest tax rate in the county. Now we would be even higher. What are we going to have to show for this? I would say that that would be fine if we were going to be able to. That's all we had to do was what I'm recommending this year. But you can see that there are a number of things that are still sitting out there in the future. Yeah. There's significant paving and sidewalk repair. There's still a number of renovations you're going to continue to need to do at your middle school, like additional restrooms, the lighting needs updated. You should replace the ceiling <coughs> at some point. There's no weight room at that facility. We'd like to update the weight room at the high school, which was cut this year. Um, the tech ed areas are in vast need of improvement. The locker rooms need improved. There's still security <laughs> upgrades that need to happen at the middle school. Um, the economy gym floor is in um, questionable condition. Flooding. Uh, flooding, warping. Um, there's, there's definitely going to be a need to do that. Um, you're going to eventually have some roofing repairs and upgrades to some of the canopies. Um, your bleachers and your and your stadium are going to need to be maintained. Eventually, you're going to, I mean, you just did your turf, but eventually you need to think about putting money away so that when it comes time to replace that turf, you have it there. Um, you know, we should have a central supply storage area. Now, we might be able to use one of our current buildings to develop those types of things. Uh, and eventually, I think we've, we've had it out there before, but administration really doesn't have a home in this district. We have, we're scattered all over the place, so um, it isn't the most effective, but we're making it work. Um, so there are a number of future capital needs that have to happen in this district, and delaying things one more year is how we got where we are. So that's my recommendation and my thought on it. I don't like to see my taxes go up either, but we've tried to minimize that impact as much as possible. We didn't go for exceptions to the index. We didn't look for a 10% tax increase. Um, we cut well over four and a half million dollars from this budget that was originally produced. So we haven't been sitting around not thinking about options on where we could save and cut. We do that all the time. And I do that constantly with the speakers. I do it every day. I look for better options and better ways to do things and more efficient ways to do things. Um, but it's, you know, we know we have to do them, so we have to, we have to make, you know, what we're thinking are the best recommendations to move us forward. Always keeping in mind, at least from my perspective, I'm sure Dr. Welder said, we want academics to be at the forefront. That's why we're investing in so much technology. That's why we're investing in uh, the <coughs> curricular textbooks. Um, even after we spend you know, a million dollars on technology, we're still going to have classrooms that don't have a computer in them. I mean, that's, that's not good. I mean, we need to start uh, you know, stretching out. And if we want to see academic improvement in this district, we have to start challenging people. And we have to start providing resources for people so that they can do those things. So that's my philosophy on it. I certainly hear where you're coming from from a stat tax standpoint. I get where the highest millage um, I think that might have been, I can't speak for my predecessors, but I think there was probably some mismanagement of prior um, budgets and resources in this district, and you're not going to recover from that overnight. Um, I think we're making strides, but we can't correct all of the sins of the past right now with this one budget. I also think what a millage garners here is quite different than what a millage garners in another school district. Sure. And so we're, I mean, Beaver County hasn't been reassessed for how long? So we're at a, at a disadvantage with what sure. we're able to collect on a mill. Sure. I mean, a mill where I came from was three point six million dollars. So. Yeah. In, in the difficulty you're faced with, right? I want to even talk about Beaver County in general. Let's talk about this school. You you're not getting more housing coming in 
substantially. You're not getting more businesses coming in. Well, I think Valerie might disagree with that. Well, <laughs> I can tell you, I live in, we pay more taxes than anybody in this district. I can tell you that. Well, all I can say is I don't see a lot of construction going on. I don't see what happens in other school districts. And I agree with you that the village doesn't give you as much in this district as in other districts. And that's the problem we're going to be faced with for the next 15, 20 years. You, you're not going to get out of this dilemma. You don't have enough income base to do something here to do these types of things. But we're not disagreeing that, with you that these have to be done. We've been here. We've been coming to board meetings since we moved in for eight years, and we've seen what's happened. You just can't generate enough income without, you probably could go 10 mills and you wouldn't have enough to do what you need to do. That's the problem we have in this district. I don't have an answer for it. I look at some numbers on here and, and I look at, you know, 100,000 going into budgetary reserves. Uh, we move 650,000 from transfers from other funds. It used to be 750. So you, you say you have a 3% increase, but it's higher than that because you move funds around. It's taxes that have been sitting over there, or funds that have been sitting over there. And you pull them over into this year's budget, and it lowers what you think you're spending. That you're spending more than you really are showing on this paper because of these reductions. I don't understand how you lose three hundred ninety-five thousand dollars in interest. I don't know. No, no, that, that's not. That's. I think that's mischaracterized. <laughs> let, let me help. All right. Help. It says three ninety-five on this page. Let, let me. Let me help. To Mr. Weir's point. There was a recognition by the board several years ago when I came on the board that there were insufficient funds to maintain the existing buildings. It was a historic problem because every time you got into a budget scenario, the first thing that got cut were things to fix a roof, to patch a, a parking lot, to replace a truck, etc. And those accumulated over time. At that point in time, four budgets ago, the board understood that need was only going to increase and put into place basically an instruction to the business office that every year a portion of the operating fund should be transferred over to the capital projects so that to your point we could budget it on an even basis over a number of years and then spend it as necessary for very large products projects that were anomalies and were not equal year over year over year. That's what started the 750, 750, 750, etc. You have a budget this year that shows a $100,000 transfer and you want to micromanage if there's a $10,000 building of monies that have already been transferred into capital projects because you think that's going to save the district money. When in reality, the elephant in the room is you haven't transferred $750,000 into capital projects this year, yet you know that there are needs that are six to eight million dollars on a deferred maintenance basis. And it's not just paving. There was then a second mandate from the board that said, your curriculum is outdated because how the historic budget was balanced, to one of the points that you made, was that when the budget Come January or February, when we realized that the budget was running over what uh, the actuals were running over budget, the existing business manager at that point in time froze curriculum purchases, which is why you end up with a 1997 social studies curriculum and a 2003 physics curriculum, and there are not enough books to service the four or five rotations of class. So they have one rotation of books that has to be left in the classroom, they can't take it home because there aren't sufficient books, and the books they do have are 10 to 20 years old. So there was a second mandate by the board to begin to fund curriculum over an extended period of time. My last recollection of that, and Dr. Walter, you, you can help me with it, was somewhere that there was a five to seven year rotation basis associated with curriculum in all of the schools. The third component of this budget, and, and by the way, I, I'm not in favor of a tax increase at all. And, and to your point, there is not a significant economic base upon which you can leverage taxes and immediately garner a new revenue source. You are in a situation where inflation approximates 3% of your budget on a given basis. And of that inflation, 91.3% 
is outside of your control because it's contractual. It's utilities, it's teacher salaries, it's the bus contract, pick. So you have a natural 2 to 3% inflationary increase on 92% of your budget. And the average increase in state and federal subsidies is actually almost nil. So if, if the budget for local taxes is approximately 40% of your budget and state and federal taxes are 60% of your budget, the local portion must not only make up for the 3% inflation for their part, but the other two-thirds from the state and the federal government that are insufficient, which means now your 3% is 9%. And there is no elegant solution for that other than two very distinct avenues. The first avenue was don't fix anything, don't buy anything, Put your thumb on the teacher's salaries because that's a significant portion of what you're capable of, of affording. And as a result, you have economic outcomes that are in the 60% range and then you question why you lose a significant portion of students to charter schools. Most certainly Bain Academy. The other avenue, which I don't know if anybody on the board has ever approved, is go and fix everything all at once which is what they did between 2002 and 2008 when they built four brand new buildings in a school district with declining enrollment. Right? And then I hear that the middle school, junior high should have been closed down, yet there was no alternatives to where to place those students in a physical building. There was no physical place to put those 680 students. And so the board chooses to try to creatively fund it by not borrowing, but by a process of transferring monies every year in a capital projects under the belief that instead of borrowing money, you can save it and spend it over time to bring a 1960 building last renovated in 1987 up to current standards without some bitch and moan that it's not all going to be done at one time. And the biggest component of that was the HVAC system, which primarily was heat. Of the $4.7 million, 3.8 of it was our heat's failing. And the steam system is causing structural damage to the building because it's weeping within the walls of the building and therefore the, the plaster and everything is falling down and there's damage to the floor. And by the way, the sewer lines that go out to the street are also clogged up because we haven't maintained those either. But other than that, everything is fine in that building. So it is really, really difficult on a macro basis to understand that in the last three years, the board has put in very formalized funding processes to try to average out and save monies for long-term renovations to then have discussions about whether we should buy boys' basketball uniforms this year or buy them next year. I have to assume that our administration is well enough informed that they are going to bring to us logical decisions. And, and very honestly, I haven't seen anything extravagant come out of the administration at some point in time. One of the perfect examples was nobody in the administration approached the board and said, we need to buy $400,000 worth of bleachers in the field house. That, that discussion did not occur. The field house is a gift, right? You have a primary building and gymnasium within the high school. It's a legacy asset. The idea is to keep that legacy asset, but that doesn't mean it necessarily will function as it always did function. And nobody pushed buying $400,000 worth of bleachers. What did we do? We shut down the bleachers. And I don't think anybody is crying boo-hoo that the round ball basketball tournament over Thanksgiving isn't in the, in the field house this year. And those $75 or $150 or whatever we got in fees um, was an offset. So if you want to talk about the budget, and I'm going to finish being on my soapbox and be done. I've been on the board for three years. The first year, the budget was 5-4. The second year, the budget was 5-4. The preliminary budget this year was 5-4. And yet the four of you have no real understanding of what is in the budget, nor have you spent the time to understand the components of the budget. But you'll pick something that you don't like, 
And therefore, you'll say no to the budget. I don't like that we're making it a middle school. I don't like that we didn't fire two teachers. I didn't like that we didn't hire two teachers. I didn't like that we're building a pole building for the, bat, the brand new batting cage and the sleds and everything that we're just buying for the field. So you micromanage something that you can understand because you refuse to put in the vested knowledge to spend the effort to understand what's really in the budget. Then you come to the board meeting and you espouse an opinion with no background to it. You just say, ah, I like blue over red. And that is phenomenally frustrating to an organization that is trying to dig itself out of a financial hole. If three years ago we had not restructured the finances of the school district and delayed the teacher contract, we would have been financially bankrupt. We are educationally bankrupt right now, and we are trying to move from that. We would have been financially bankrupt. Of the $3.8 million in available fund balance, almost $3.5 million of that $3.8 million would have been used in teacher salaries and additional debt service. You would have been bankrupt. And no one on the board three years ago understood the severity of that financial situation. So now you have a plan, you have a structure, and the majority of the board has agreed to that plan and structure. It's very difficult for me to accept the micromanagement when you haven't spent the time to go in and look at the macro aspects of what is in the budget, right? What's the elephant in the room? The elephant in the room is, I don't care how much you raise taxes, you can't generate sufficient revenues in one year to solve your problems. And therefore, you have to fund it over a, a long period of time, and you have to acknowledge that you're not going to get everything you want in the year that you want it. And that's the biggest deal with capital projects. Economy Elementary needs a roof. It is not going to wait for you to decide that you have enough money when the roof starts to leak, you have to have the money available. So you deviate from the plan, which is basically what we did. We're supposed to fund three quarters of a million dollars into the capital projects this year. We funded $100,000 into a $750,000 need. And the comment is, we really should think about buying a $4,200 overseas container versus a $10,000 pole bill. When the real discussion is, should we abandon funding long-term strategies, both in curriculum and in capital projects to fix the problems of the historic district? Or should we just go back to what we used to do? Which is the things you can make decisions on, which is that 9.7% of the budget, you just cut it to nothing. And then come back and complain that the achievable rate is 62.3%. When you talk about the highest taxes in the district, the district does have the highest taxes in Beaver County. But on an average basis, by the way, a kid, it costs the same amount to educate a kid, whether he comes out of a $12,000 assessed home or a $270,000 assessed home. The cost of a kid is the same. And if you look, I'm not a big advocate of the Beaver County Times, but the one thing they do do every year is they take what the average assessed value is of every school district in Beaver County. They multiply it by the millage, and they divide it by the number of students that they're serving. And you will find out, when you look at that analysis, that the average taxes for Ambridge really are in the top third of taxes in Beaver County. So yes, you have the highest millage rate, but you also have one of the lowest assessed values. And at the end of the day, it still costs $7,812 to educate a student. But what you have is facilities in this school district that have been neglected so long, and I'm agreeing with you, Mr. Sass, and I sat on a commission that looked at buildings and they basically said get rid of the junior high, spend seven million dollars and redo uh, economy elementary. elementary, you'd have a perfect building, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be spending, you're going to spend five, six million dollars on this junior high before you're finished, easily, if not more. No doubt. So nobody listened to what happened then to take this district and make it more financially feasible, do it the buildings right, everybody who's ever was on that board at the time didn't want to piss off any Taxpayers, they wanted their kids to go to economy, they wanted their kids to go to junior high, and now we're suffering the consequences. And it's not going to stop because this, this, you're not going to get more money out of this Beaver County. I don't care if you go to 90 mills, but it's and, not going to be. But one of the arguments is, and, I, and I've talked to people privately about it before whether a building is occupied or not occupied, the debt associated with that building still exists. You're going to pay the debt service on that building, whether there's a soul in that building or there's not a soul in that building. That's the travesty of this thing, right? That you build four major buildings in a, in a six-year period, right? 
you run almost 89, $91 million of debt, it balloons from 4% of your budget to 11% <coughs> of your budget, right? And then you go backward and say, on a needs assessment, maybe, maybe we shouldn't have done that, right? Barn door's already open and the horse is already gone. So I don't disagree with you at all, but that's, that's the deck of cards that has been played, right? And, and now the role of the board is to basically try to structure the finances in a way that on an even basis, you can try to dig yourself financially out of that hole. No doubt. Hope you got a big shot. Big hole. A lot of digging that's been going on. A lot of digging. Sure. Um, so what is the risk of speak up. Our fund balance, our our fund balance is budgeted at eight percent, right? Now we talked about this. Yeah. So the standard we also talked about is is five to eight. Between five to eight. Right. So what's what's the big risk for us to use some of the fund balance to mitigate against the potential tax increase? Like in your opinion The current fund the current budget as presented will utilize two hundred and ninety five thousand dollars of the fund balance as it stands right now. It would normally I would say that if you had a one time capital project that you were doing, that would be acceptable to draw from your fund balance. But I don't believe that that's the situation we're in. I as just discussed between the gentlemen here, I believe you have several ongoing things that are going to continue to need to be addressed in this district from a capital project standpoint. So in my mind, I view those items as more operational over time. You're either going to have to continue to put larger sums of money aside in your capital projects or capital reserve fund, or you're going to have to fund those out of your general fund capital projects. So normally I would say yes, if it was a one-time thing, we're just going to do the parking lot this year and it was we didn't have to do any other paving, yeah, I'd say pull it from your fund balance it would be okay. But that's not the case here. I think they become more operational in nature just because of the fact that you haven't done it for so long. And the risk of doing it this year just compounds the problem next year because you're still gonna have the same needs and you're gonna have <coughs> additional needs and you just now you're gonna come to yourself at a point where you're gonna need that 10, 12, 15 percent increase in taxes, and, and you don't want to be there, and you're not going to have any reserves to pull them on. So that's the danger. Right, unless we take the ball. Well, we'll take the credit for the, um, the potential of the summer and not just coming back to the state, or not just coming back to the state. I would say until you see that trend really happening, right. it, would be a, it would be a high risk. Um, I skipped over it, but this was on the last presentation. I just wanted to keep it in there and let you know that there are a number of things that we didn't put in this budget that were initially considered for the budget. So throughout the deliberations, there were a number of things that we did have to cut and we did have to eliminate. So um, I didn't want you to think that we you know, didn't do due diligence. We have been doing due diligence. Um, the fund balance numbers, again, I just give you this slide as information so you can see where the fund balance has been. Uh, the line that runs through it is the percentage of fund balance to your expenditures. So the, the orange line represents your total expenditures. The blue bar represents where your fund balance, undesignated fund balance has been. And then the line represents the percentage of that. Again, I talked about future capital projects. So just to summarizing again, uh, that's where we are, $295,000 coming out of the fund balance. Um, there's your fund balance numbers. We're looking at about $3.8 million in undesignated and $361,000 of a remain for capital projects that you could choose to transfer at a future time if you wish to. Well, you take, you've taken the operating fund deficit and taken it out of capital projects instead of out of the operating account. Correct. Right? Yeah. I mean, in reality, your undesignated is $3.5 million, which is 7% of your 49 million. Correct. And that three hundred sixty-one thousand dollars under capital projects that includes the hundred thousand that you're planning to put in. It does not include the hundred thousand that would go into the capital reserve fund. That's just the difference. Okay. So that'll be four. That was initially assigned so that we had some flexibility in case we needed it for other reasons. We could reassign it. So we decided to leave it there and provide a little bit of flexibility 
the boards could certainly choose to just make that transfer and move it all over to the capital reserve if they wish to. Once it moves the capital reserve, the problem with that is it has to stay there. It can only be used for capital projects or to pay off debt service. And the 100000 that's going in there, is that going to capital go to projects? The capital reserve. It can go to the capital reserve. So it's capital reserve. And it's purposeful. Because once you put money in the capital reserve, right, and, and I explained, there's $5 million of debt over there. So we basically assured that $5 million of funding from the general fund would go over there and basically could not be unwound, right? Right. Or else basically what you did was a folly. You borrowed money, but you didn't fund the money. You really did borrow money. That wasn't the plan. So that's why it was done as a capital project. Yeah, no future future. boards could, undes could move that back for any reason. It's, it's there permanently. Um, you did mention something about interest. I think you were confusing interest from a revenue standpoint from revenue from, from expense for interest. That 397 that's going down is interest expense on debt service because we refunded it in the remission. So that's a good thing that you're seeing. Um, food service fund, I just wanted to talk about briefly. You have the line item detail on that, but um, I have to say, um, this has been a remarkable turnaround. Um, I'm really proud of Janet and, and the work she's put in, but um, we had a long discussion because it was too much to my surprise that when I got here that they had never done a budget in the food service program, ever. Um, and we've had long discussions and meetings about restructuring and how we do it and how we write staff through a budget process and how we put different <coughs> ordering and inventory protocols in place this year. Um, you can see the remarkable results. Right now, we've turned around what puts losing $200,000 a year to probably making about seventy-five dollars or $76,000 this year, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, our reserves had dropped from a half million dollars to almost a little under $100,000. We're going to be adding to that finally. Um, we are still recommending a lunch price increase for next year because we know that we have Again, like everything else, we're going to have some capital project needs. We're going to have to replace some equipment in some of our kitchens. And we're trying to build up that, that reserve a little bit so that we don't have to uh, go to the general fund and ask for that money. We want to be able to fund that out of the food service program. So um, we are asking for a 25, 25 cent increase on breakfast and lunch. Uh, you can see what the prices will be. 175 for breakfast next year, 270 at the elementary for lunch, and 290 secondary level. Um, keep in mind though that next year State Street, Highland, and the middle school will all be free. They'll be in the CDP program so all the students will get free lunch and breakfast. That's also helped us a lot because we get additional subsidy for that. So we've seen our federal and state subsidies increasing through having those CDP programs at those schools. What does CDP mean? It's a certified, I forget what the admission stand for, but it basically allows every student to be free. It is regardless of economic situations. Um, there you can see the numbers, our lunch sales, breakfast sales. We broke them down a little more detail than we have in the past by building so that we can do a little more analysis in future years to see where our revenue streams are good and where they're not good. Uh, we did a little more structuring with the catering and how we're billing for that. We put a new process in place for how we bill for catering so that we get those things back quicker, quicker turnover for that. Uh, and Janet has done a nice job of getting securing some grants this year, and she's going to continue to have those for next year as well. Uh, revenues right now are projected to be a little under $1.5 million next year. Our expenses at $1.4 million in the budget, so we're anticipating a revenue increase or profit next year of about $150,000. Um, we did a lot of restructuring with personnel, right staffing it, looking at the hours, eliminating some positions that we felt were redundant. Uh, saved a lot of money in food purchases because there was a lot of inventory control issues and there were freezers that were packed full of food that they weren't utilizing in a timely fashion. So by putting simple things in place, by controlling inventory and reorder points and planning menus around commodities that were, were coming in from the government that were free of charge, uh, we really were able to save a lot on food expenses. And also the same thing with supplies when we ordered those, developing inventory points for reorder and really working with the staff and training them on what to do. So really proud of what that food service department has done. Those ladies have worked hard, Janet has worked hard, and I think we're seeing the results of what good planning and organization does. As a board member, I want to say thank you for all your hard work and please pass <coughs> on to the staff. Well, I, I will. We appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. 
Um, so all other things I mentioned are here on this slide. The only thing I didn't mention that's on there is that we do have their labor contract that expires in June 2019. So we will be negotiating a new contract with them uh, probably by January of next year. We'll be starting that process. And that's it. Final budget will be approved on June 20th. Again, I'll put the slides up. I'll put the revised uh, numbers up for everyone. I'll put the food service budget up for everyone on the website tomorrow. Um, if you have questions or comments, I'll be happy to take them. If you think of something later and you want to shoot me an email, it goes for the public as well. I'll be happy to answer them. If you want to come in and go over the budget, happy to do that with George Your door isn't always open. Well, it's not always open. It wasn't open the last couple of days because I was preparing for this, but usually it is. If you schedule something, it'll be open. <laughs> Okay. What's the future ramification of only putting a hundred thousand dollars instead of the seven fifty? Now you're going to be now half short. I mean, next year, you said we're going to be. You know, we, we have a plan to go out there. That sort of screws the plan, doesn't it? You betcha. Well, yeah, and one of the reasons was we made the choice to fund, I think, six hundred thousand dollars worth of capital projects in the general fund in a capital projects line item. So, you know. We just took the strategy that instead of transferring the full 750, we were going to spend 600 of it this year in the budget and only transfer 100. But, um, you know, I certainly would love to be able to. But it's okay. It we can just use fund balance. It's always there. So, so as you look at nine years out, what do we look at for the next nine years that we need to put in there to make that number come even? The estimates that I saw Mr. McCausen have is you need approximately $1.2 million a year for the next 10 years right. to either maintain the existing infrastructure or to catch up existing improvements. $1.2 million. $100,000 doesn't get to there, does it? No. Now, to, to, not that, that I want to be unsophisticated, but what they did is there's about $500,000 of increments into maintenance up in the operating budget versus a transfer. So they didn't shortcut it as badly as they should. Now the three hundred thousand, that's a shortcut. I mean, that, that that's a haircut. That's just going to come out of cash. Um, so the only, you know, the, one of the stipulations I have is I don't want it to come out of assigned capital projects. I want it to come out of the general fund balance because part of that um, addresses that every time you're in a situation um, that's associated with a, a, a problem, you can just use fund balance to fix your problems. Right? If you structure out fund balance to reoccurring revenues versus reoccurring expenditures, you eliminate much of that dialogue because you take away all the one-time things that you should squirrel away for long-term projects. It's just a, it's a basic philosophy. We, we could also agree go, to, but I mean, we could really go back and we can make that transfer of 750, pulling it from the assigned capital projects fund balance. That's always an option as well. But it's still there for capital projects. But I hear you. That's not as easy as What kind of effort is being made by the administration, including the various principals, to to seek out grant more grant funding, to, to look go out and look for grants? You know, when all of this stuff happened with Parkland. There were a number of school districts that got funding from the government to increase security, you know, to put in new security measures. That's just one thing I'm talking about. But from a curriculum standpoint or STEM standpoint, to search out these grants on a regular basis and apply for them, I mean, that kind well, of income, Barry I think, does, would help. Barry does Title One, Two, and one, four, two, and four, exactly. which we get about nine hundred thousand dollars for. Well, RTO that's twenty-two nine fifty-five. A two I for reading. Yeah. K one two three is coming. The NIMSI grant is coming. The NIMSI um, grant and, is and another good thing that's taken place. But I'm talking about over and above that, like you know, from the Grable Foundation or the Pittsburgh Foundation. There's all kinds of foundations that are out there. We have what teachers are we actively writing grant. doing? Kim gets grants. We have teachers writing grants all the time. Now, they're mini grants. They're $1,000 or $2,000. Yeah, I'm talking about money. <laughs> There's only so much time. You know, and we are all, not to complain, but we are all stretched very thin. And I think everybody that has been writing grants be worth or finding grants. Would it be worth it to 
hire a grant writer. Get a grant writer, a consultant, not somebody you know that's on staff, but a consultant that's paid per diem or per per contract or things like it's that. It's certainly worth looking into. My only criticism of grants is it's not a continual funding source and it takes so much time to manage the grant and provide the spreadsheets and the staffing and they come and go. And so to set grants up and set programs up and then lose the money the following year, um, it's, it's... Well, there are a number of grants out there that go for two, three, four, five years. And if you have some consultant, for example, working on this all the time, bringing in grant after grant after grant that could actually, you know, move on down the road that way. There are, there are grant writers out there that take a percentage of the grants. We've been saying this for, for seven years. Get a grant writer who takes a percentage of the grant. I don't care if it's for six months, one year, or five years. We need to get money anywhere we can get money. I have somebody I can contact. That, Please do. The district has done that in the past several times. I'm sure Mrs. Walker remembers that. And we never got the kind of grants, the volumes of money that everybody talked about. Because a lot of those grants, the district has to fall within a certain percentage of free and reduced lunch for kids or the, the economics of and it. And you don't think we do? And then at that time, we did not qualify for a lot of those. And um, part of the other um, issue with that was that a lot of the larger grants, that were out there, you got the grant money maybe for the first two or three years, and then you had to self-fund it after that. So the problem became, if we didn't have the money in the beginning, where were we getting the money in year four and five? How long ago did you do that? It's been and since I've been on the board, we've done it twice. I can remember. Yeah, in 2000, there was a grant. Well, oh, that's a long time ago. Yeah, it's 18 that's years ago. ago. It's only 18 years ago. <laughs> no, we've had. I haven't been on the board. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Two times part during is, my tenure we had grant writing. Ten years ago, what you did with grant writing, and look at it today, what's done with grant writing, you don't know what's going to happen unless you go out and ask and see. I, that's all we're asking. You know, make some phone calls, do some inquiries, contact people that you know. You, you've got to start doing something. If we're 1.2 million a year for the next ten years, which is four mills every year, not even cotton, anything else, where the hell are we going to be? We're going to be bankrupt. That's where we're going to be. Or you end up like Rochester, graduating 60 people out of their senior class. I think we're in a position we need to do everything we possibly can do to generate money. And I know you, some of you don't like me speaking like that, but that's my personal feeling. I've run a billion dollar corporation, and I can tell you right now, you don't sit on your hands and say, well, that's what happened 10 years ago, or three years ago, or five years ago. It doesn't work that way.